when a child is invited to a friend's house, there are two very different questions that are asked by different people involved in that process. The child asks, will it be fun? The parents of the child ask, will it be safe? Security and pleasure. Two desires that drive much of humanity's choices and decisions. And these two pursuits often overlap. And in different ways and different passages, Scripture does speak to both. But uniquely, in Psalm 16, David weaves the two together. One could easily call this psalm an ode to security and pleasure. And throughout this poetic expression of worship, David calls upon the people of God to join him in making five specific, distinct choices regarding their pleasure and their security. So as I read Psalm 16, please, you're welcome to follow along, but I'd also like you to listen and see if you can identify those five choices. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The first choice that confronts David the psalmist and by extension confronts us is the choice of source. Who or what will be the source of our security and our pleasure? Where will we go to find these things? David is clear in his answer. He takes refuge in God. God will be his security. Now we've already seen the theme of the refuge in the last two Psalms that we've studied. And here we find it again in the first verse. For in you I take refuge. What about you? What about us? Where do we go for security, for refuge? What's your source? Is it your investments? Is it your salary? Is it your work? Your family? Is it in different forms of addictions, alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex? Where, where, what, what is your refuge? Where do you go to look for, to seek out, security. There's only one infallible source, only one entity that has the power to provide ultimate security to your soul, and that is God himself. In verse 2, David transitions to a statement about pleasure. The same question, what will the source be? God is the source of his security, but now he talks about God being the source of his pleasure. You are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. Pleasure is a problem for most of us. Historically speaking, the challenge that often comes up against Christianity is, what about pain? What about the problem of pain? How can we 
How, how can God exist and be a loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God and yet allow his creation to suffer? The problem of pain. Rabbi Zacharias, a well-known Christian speaker and apologist, has a podcast that he has titled The Problem of Pleasure. And he said that for those who self name Christians or who self-identify as Christians, as followers of Jesus, the greater problem that we have is pleasure. Because it's such a powerful motivator that the enemy often uses it to lead us into sin and idolatry. The issue really is not pleasure in and of itself. It's rather the kind of pleasure, more specifically, the source of that pleasure. Take a moment to bring to your conscious mind the things that you most enjoy. Those things from which you derive the most pleasure. Maybe it doesn't take you that long to think of those things. When you've got them in your mind, I want you to imagine God approaching you, holding those things or that thing in his hands, and extending that to you, and saying to you, my daughter, my son, this is my good gift to you. Enjoy it. It was popular a number of years ago to wear those WWJD bracelets. Remember, what would Jesus do? I want to modify that question a little bit and ask you, or have you ask yourself, what would Jesus give? In other words, those pleasures that I just asked you to think of, can you imagine God giving those to you and inviting you to enjoy them? David says, every good thing I have is from you, or apart from you, I have no good thing. Now this, this gets a little bit sticky and challenging. Uh, I, I, I might step on some toes here, but does, you know, that, that Netflix series that you love to, to binge watch, can, can you imagine God giving that to you as a gift and saying, take this as my good gift to you? I'm not against everything on Netflix. That's not the point. The, the thing I'm asking is the, the sources of our pleasure, can we picture God giving them to us? Can we picture God as the source of those things? So we need to evaluate the source of our pleasure in light of God's character and presence. And then in verse 3, David calls us to evaluate the people from whom and with whom we will derive pleasure. What kind of people? David says the saints who are in the land. Now, saint, in the way he's using it there, does not mean a perfect person. A more recent edition of the NIV from 2011 states it this way. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. The holy people. Does this describe the, the kinds of people that you admire? The people that you are attracted to? The ones in whom you delight? I think more often we're drawn to the empty souls of Hollywood or the shattered lives of famous singers, performers, rappers, bands, maybe to the promiscuous lifestyle of the professional athlete. In short, David here is asking us to choose our friends and our heroes wisely. And he's saying, I have chosen that the people in which I'm going to delight, the people from which I'm going to derive pleasure that I'm going to interact with, they're going to be the noble people, they're going to be the holy people, the saints, the ones that belong to God, the ones that are committed to, in their lives to pleasing God. So again, I want you to think about your current situation. If you're a, if you're a student right now, so an adolescent or a child or maybe a university student, how do you choose the people in whom you will delight? How do you choose the people with whom you want to form friendships? Are, is it based primarily on, on appearance or maybe influence or power, maybe, maybe possessions or money? Or 
Is it the people who are quietly committed to a holy life with God? Who are the people in whom you will find pleasure and delight? This opening section of the psalm closes with verse 4 as David reminds us of the alternative. The consequences of seeking security and pleasure in anything or any place other than God is that the sorrows of that person will increase. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. Or the sorrows of those who will increase who run after other gods. This is the fruit of idolatry in a nutshell. More and more suffering. Choose the source of security and pleasure wisely. Choose the Lord as that source. The second choice with which we're confronted is the choice for contentment. David says that God has assigned to him his portion and his cup. That's an imagistic way of saying what God has given him to be his, his portion and his cup. The thing with portions is, 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 is you can imagine sitting at a meal and someone else serving you and the portion, whatever they put on your plate, that, that's your portion. And making a choice to be content with that portion. When I was growing up, there, we had some very clear rules about what we were allowed to say and not allowed to say about food that was served to us, usually by my mom. And one thing we were never allowed to say is, I don't like this. Now, that phrase, I don't like this, it was interpreted very broadly. What do I mean by that? This could be interpreted as, I don't like this. <sighs> could be interpreted as, I don't like this. So we had to be very careful because what was, the, what was the consequence? The consequence of expressing displeasure with the food that was assigned to us was a double helping of that food served by a parent, not by your own self. We were allowed to say, I don't prefer this, but we had to say it joyfully. I don't prefer this. Later on in life, we were also allowed to say, I would not choose this for my birthday meal. <laughs> but again, joyfully. So, I, you know, I was a fairly smart kid, so I tried that, to apply this policy with dessert. I don't like this ice cream. <laughs> and you know what? The dictatorship of our home changed the law. <laughs> and under the new legislation, that uh, principle no longer applied to dessert. I wanted a double portion. I wanted more. Um, and all that was offered was more of what I didn't want. And what I did want, more was not offered. And I was not content. Believe it or not, as a child, I did not enjoy eating. I know that's very, very hard for you to believe. The principle that David is stating here is that I, he will be content with what God gives him. You, Lord, have assigned to me my portion and my cup. You, Lord, have made my lot secure. And the last part of that verse, that statement, is that the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. That may seem a little bit strange to our ears today, David is alluding to the process by which the promised land was divided up among the families of the Israelites. So once they had conquered the land, Joshua gave to each family a portion of land to be theirs, and it was demarcated by boundary lines. And so David is saying, God, you've given me my portion. You've given me my possession. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. So along with David, we're invited to choose contentment with what God has provided to us. This is one of the greatest challenges involving pleasure because illicit pleasures always demand more and more of us. 
David chooses contentment to accept what God has given him as his portion in his cup. Our tendency, the human tendency, is discontent, envy. To either always want more or always want different. To be dissatisfied with what God has given. To be dissatisfied with the gifting that God has given me. And I want the gifting that he's given someone else. Or I want the possessions that he's given someone else. Or I envy the family or the spouse that others have. Or I envy their security. I envy their job. I envy their bank account. I am not content with what God has given me. This is a challenge to me. This is an area that throughout my life God has consistently had to deal with me on. It's an area for many people that leads into debt, right? Because we, we, we don't want to be content with what God has provided. We try to take things that God has not apportioned to us. We want a different cup. We want a larger portion. And David closes verse 6 with a statement about his inheritance. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Now, this is a challenge to faith for all God's people because the situations in which you find yourself right now may not be delightful. And never does Scripture call you to deny reality. When Jesus hung on the cross, he did not smile and say, I'm not suffering. This is all an illusion. Christ suffered and died to buy our redemption. So when David says, I have a delightful inheritance, he's not denying pain. He's not denying suffering. And in the situation that you're living today, God is not inviting you to deny that you're suffering or to deny that you're in grief or to deny that there's pain. But what David is suggesting is that you remember your inheritance. Inheritance is what? It's now, but it's also future to look through the pain and believe that the inheritance God has promised is real. And if we do that, if we are willing to look through the pain and the suffering and remember that the best is yet to come, that our hope lies now but also beyond, that will give us the grace to choose contentment with what God has allotted to us today. The third choice is to choose the right focus of our lives. David says, I have set the Lord always before me. So what has he chosen to make the focus or the goal of his life? It is the Lord. And consequently, he is both the goal, he is also with David. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. He is my goal, he is my security. He makes me steadfast. So, what do you look at? What's your goal? What's the guiding principle of your life? For David, it's the Lord and pleasing him, living in a way that will bring pleasure to God. If we have the wrong goal, if our eyes are looking the wrong direction, we will not arrive at the right destination. For example, I found out um, the hard way that Avenida Santo Amaro and Alameda Santo Amaro are two different streets. Um, and if you are a blind, if you have blind faith in your GPS, could lead you to problems. It did for me. Two different locations. If our focus is wrong, then our destination is going to be wrong. If we're looking at the wrong goal, no matter how sincere our hearts are, and I, I, this is so important, sincerity is not a measure of truth. It can never be. I can be sincere in heading toward a goal, but if it's the wrong goal, my sincerity will not take me to the right goal or the right destination. So have you ever consciously decided that the goal of your life is to please God? I'm not talking about salvation right now. I'm not talking about surrender to Christ in repentance for salvation. I am talking about after salvation, after redemption, 
intentionally making the goal of your life the pleasure and faithfulness to God. And the result of that choice of making God the goal is security. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. The fourth choice is to choose joy. Therefore, says David, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Now, we might look at David and say, of course you're glad and of course you're rejoicing. You're a king. You have everything you could possibly want. You have servants at your beck and call. You live in a palace. You have influence. You have power. You have authority. Of course you're glad. Of course you're rejoicing. Even a cursory reading of the Old Testament will show us that David suffered a lot. Yes, he was king. Yes, he had all those benefits, but he suffered deeply. Some of that suffering was due to a result of his own sin. We've even seen this recently. But a lot of it wasn't. Earlier in his life, for years, David was a fugitive, an outlaw, living in caves, living in the wilderness, being persecuted unjustly by King Saul. David saw his own sons turn against him. He saw murder in his own household, rape in his own household. There was profound suffering. So David's not saying this, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices because his life has all been easy and perfect. It's a choice. Joy, or at least the decision to rejoice, is a choice. It's a choice based on faith. Faith that he knows his ultimate destination. It says that God will not abandon him to the grave. That God will not let him see decay. This is not a statement on David's part that he believes he's immortal or that his body is never going to die. He's saying that the grave, death, is not the final destination for someone who belongs to God. For a child of God, death is a passage point. It's not a destination. And he's convinced that God will not abandon him to the grave. Death is not the end. So even in the challenge of daily life, David rejoices over his future and over the presence and promise of God. Rejoicing and thankfulness often go hand in hand. Generally, I think we imagine rejoicing being a response to circumstances. When things are going well, when things are happy, when I have everything I need and, and, and things are easy, I rejoice. When life is hard, when there's suffering, when there's illness, when there's grief, then we don't naturally tend to rejoice. But I want to present a challenge to us all to rejoice in the grief, to rejoice in the suffering, and again, not denying or ignoring the pain but choosing to look through it to our final destination. There's hope on the other side. We grieve the pain and loss of this life, but we rejoice in the promise that God has given us of the future. And so I invite you to, to make a rejoicing, a list of rejoicing, like we've done with a list of thanksgiving before. In the trials, in the hardship, in your life now, for what can you still rejoice in, in the Lord? What blessings has he still given you? And make the choice to focus on a glad heart and a rejoicing tongue, to choose joy. The final choice of these five is a choice to choose eternity. Chapter, I'm sorry, verse 11 of the psalm is one of my favorite verses, but it's one that challenges me almost every day. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The first challenge is to follow the path of life that God has revealed. And we understand today that this path begins in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Son of God who came to earth, lived a human life, died an innocent death, and rose a divine resurrection. 
In 1 John 5.11, the Apostle John writes this, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The path to life begins with surrender to Jesus as the Son of God, a complete giving over of our lives to him. But it's a path. In other words, it has a beginning, but it's also a continued process. It begins with surrender and continues through obedience. And the difficult choice is to choose to believe that true joy lies only in God's presence. We've been so deceived by the world and by our own flesh, deceived into thinking that we can find joy in idolatry and sin. And the more we seek it there, the more our sorrows and sufferings of the soul increase. And we trade the perfect eternal joy for a weak, perverted, temporary substitute. Okay, it's time to recycle an illustration. So many of you have heard it before, and if you have, just be patient. Um, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I was here at church during the week, and my family and I were planning to go to a shuascaria for dinner. So I had decided early in the day that I was going to make the churrascaria pay. We had that prejuízo. You know, that was, my, that was my goal. That was my life purpose that day. So to that end, I decided I am not going to eat lunch. So that when I arrive at dinner time at the churrascaria, I will be ready and empty. And I, this went great until about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I started to get a little hungry. And I was thinking about the lunch that I had not eaten. And I just thought, you know what, maybe just a little something to take the edge off so that I can, you know, be even more prepared for the evening, you know. Um, so I went into the kitchen. And I just thought, I wonder what's been left here, you know. Who has forgotten things here in the church kitchen over this last week? And I did found something, find something. I found one thing only. It was one solitary, old, hard, bonzing you. I ate it. And you know what? It was not good. I ate that dry thing. I gnawed that thing down. And it sat and expanded in my stomach. You know, it just, it's like it absorbed all the fluids of my body. And I felt... I didn't feel good. And by the time I got to the Shwaskadia, honestly, I wasn't even hungry. And I was like, because of this one measly, old, hard, bonzinho. And to me, that has continually been an illustration of trading the great and true pleasure that God offers his children for a really lousy substitute. And when we train ourselves to love the old, hard bonzinho, it compromises our openness to enjoying the eternal shuhasku of the soul. <laughs> now, one reason that we choose the bonzinho is because we don't believe in the eternal shohasko of the soul. We read the last phrases of, of, verse six, of verse 11, and it says that God is going to fill his people with eternal pleasures at his right hand. And I imagine that for many of us, and I'm putting myself in the shoes of an adolescent, I used to be one, if someone had said to me, you know, when I was 15, 16, 17, God wants to give you eternal pleasure. Because, humanly speaking, our ability to appreciate the pure pleasure of God has been so compromised. What I would hear when someone said godly pleasure, what I would hear was boring Godly and pleasure, uh, mm, they, don't, they don't really go together. 
And as I've said before, uh, you know, when we think of heaven, we think of eternity with God, and, and this is, you know, right here, this is our, our perspective point, and we imagine heaven, we imagine eternal pleasures as being a never-ending church service. As I'm a pastor, I don't want a never-ending church service. And the issue is that we have become so compromised by sin and by idolatry that we cannot conceive that when God says something is pleasurable, it will be pleasurable. And when he says that it's eternal, it will be eternal. And that it will be pleasure that does not generate guilt, pleasure that does not generate shame, pleasure that does not generate self-accusation, and pleasure that does not have an end or limit. Now, because our ability to appreciate pure godly pleasure it has been compromised by sin, because of that, the growth in the ability to appreciate godly pleasure does include an aspect of discipline. Here's another free, honest confession. My brother is an opera singer. I am proud of him and I love him and I do not enjoy opera. <laughs> At the same time, I can look and say, I... I understand that the performance of opera takes profound commitment, practice, dedication, and skill. I can say that, but I don't enjoy it. For me to learn to enjoy opera would take a lot of investment on my part. I think I could probably get there. And as God begins to mold us to prepare us for pure godly pleasure that's going to last forever, that will be truly pleasurable, the process of that is a process of discipline and it's a process of perseverance and obedience. I've used the example before of learning, for me, learning to drink coffee without sugar. You know, I do feel, yes, I'm arrogant about it, but I do feel that I have moved to a higher plane of pleasure by appreciating it, and I really enjoy it so much more than, than I used to. I'm not making a judgment about anybody else in this room. That's between you and God, what you do with your coffee. But, but truly, um, but the, the, just to illustrate the process, it was a process of discipline. It was the process itself wasn't enjoyable, but arriving at the destination... Is, is a blessing. So the training through obedience as God prepares his people for eternal pleasures, for joy in his presence, and that, that never end. It's like being able to eat and never get full or sick. That the God's pleasure that he just wants to pour out to us. And we're like, eh. I've got a really hard bonzinho over here that looks really attractive. So with David, we are each invited to choose God as our source of pleasure and security. To choose to be content with what God has provided in these areas to choose to make him the focus and goal of our lives and to choose to rejoice, to choose joy, and finally to choose eternity over the temporal. Let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge that in our fallen human state, none of us would choose these five things. And we acknowledge that it is only because of your grace and mercy working in us 
that we can then choose for you to be the source of our pleasure and security. That we can choose the eternal, the eternal over the temporal. That we can choose to be content, choose to rejoice, and choose for you to be the focus of our lives. Have mercy on us, Lord. We need it. Give us the grace to encourage and uplift those who are around us, our brothers and sisters, your children. We need each other. And Lord, prepare us. Give us these eternal pleasures at your right hand. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.